and welcome to Material Girls, a scholarly podcast about popular culture. I'm Marcel Cosman. And I'm Hannah McGregor. And hey, you might know us from the podcast, Which Please. Since we finished our read-through of the Harry Potter series, we're trying something a little different, but with the same overall goal of digging into the things we find interesting to see how they work. In each episode of Material Girls, we're going to choose an object of study. This will be something that's having, or has had, a moment of popularity. We're going to think through the material reasons for that popularity. So... The episodes will be divided into three main segments. First, Why This, Why Now is the segment where we'll introduce the thing in question and we'll talk about why we think it's interesting and make some preliminary guesses about why it had or is having a moment. The next segment, The Theory We Need, is where Mm -hmm. we get scholarly. Hannah and I are both academics by training, and we just can't help but bring in critical theory to make sense of what's happening in the world. So in this segment, we'll introduce the theory or method that we're using to unpack the popularity or success of our object of study, sort of like a primer or intro lesson, so that we're all coming into the conversation on, you know, equalish footing. Once we've got the theory, we head into a segment called In This Essay I Will. It's a Twitter joke. If you're not on Twitter, you don't know it, but it's great. It's a great Twitter joke. This is where we make our arguments about the episode's topic. So we'll put the theory to work analyzing specific moments from or about our object of study, like a particular scene or the way it's circulated among audiences. In other words, this is where we turn our hot takes into hot takes supported with evidence and analysis, aka scholarship. Scholarship. (laughs) And of course, we'll start each episode with a quick hello because we're very busy and this is the only time we get to hang out. (laughs) Hi, Hannah. (laughs) Hi, Marcel. Just real quick, just tell me how your day's been. I made myself a pizza for breakfast. (gasps) What? Breakfast pizza? Did you do something to make it breakfasty or was it just breakfasty by virtue of eating it to break your fast? It was breakfasty by virtue of eating it to break my fast, but I did put it in the oven before 1030 in the morning. So I feel like that is like a legit breakfast. How was your day? How was it? It's uh, 11.52 where you are right now. How did it go? It's 11.52 where I am now. <laughs> I had a uh, talk. I was delivering a virtual talk <laughs> I thought you were for... going to say a taco. <laughs> you thought I was going to say a taco? Well, you said I had a talk, and I thought you were going to say I had a taco. <laughs> you got confused because you had pizza for breakfast, and you were like, everybody must be having chaotic breakfasts, but not this guy. I had the standard breakfast of weird small vegan cookies you know those like cookies like quote-unquote cookies that come in a sealed bag they're like a soft little nug and they're like it's a cookie but like there's too much like psyllium husk in it to be what anybody would consider a tasty treat oh my god and now i'm drinking some sparkling kefir beverage so (laughs) my (laughs) my insides Who knows what they're going to do? Ooh, materiality. (laughs) Bet you regret asking me about my day now. I do. Okay, Marcel, it's why this, why now time. What are we talking about today? Well, Hannah, you know that I love gossip. Oh, same. And I am a total sucker for soft boys. Medium same. Fair. That's fair. (laughs) Well, today, for our object of study, I want to talk about gossip and soft boys and more. So, I would like to introduce to you the memoir, Spare, by Prince Harry. Hannah, tell me everything you know about this book. Uh, I know that it is a relatively recent publication. I know that it is a huge bestseller. And I believe very strongly in my heart that it was probably ghostwritten. And I think that there's a scene where he talks about putting the same moisturizer on his frostbitten penis that his mother used to wear. And that that 
sort of was a weird a weird moment for him and that is that's it for what i know about the content of the book yeah legit. Um, that there's a scene where he <laughs> has to put moisturizer on his frostbitten and wang yeah. but um i am kind of like a follower like a b level follower of royal family gossip like mm-hmm. i have been following the prince harry and Meghan markle scandals um obviously you know i'm pro monarchy so Mm-mm. no no i'm no. not i think it's you're very pro sad. markle key well you know what i feel really interested in the showdown that is happening right now between the power of american popular culture and the power of british inherited wealth and monarchy yeah i feel like we had a real like Oprah versus the Queen mm. kind of moment when it came to like who gets to define the zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. And I feel like quite clearly Oprah won. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> like obviously the monarchy's bad. And then also I'm like, but is American celebrity culture good? Like, I don't know <laughs> if I'm ready to make that claim, but uh Yeah. But yeah, so like I know I know context-ish around it. I know a lot about Diana. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that for sure, because that's the age we are. Yes. But before we talk about being geriatric millennials who grew up under the rainbow of Princess Diana celebrity, I want to first just like touch on the fact that like you haven't read the book. Never read any books. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but what I think is really interesting and the reason why I think this is such a good uh, object of study for us is that it is such a cultural text that even having not read it, you are aware of like the circumstances surrounding it. You you know that it's a memoir, mm. right? Like, you know, so you've got like all of the kind of culture stuff, like whether it was ghostwritten or Prince Harry himself sat down with a pen and paper and, you know, sweated out every single chapter. No way to know. <laughs> you still you still like have specific expectations of like what the book is and what it does and how people are going to respond to it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It is undeniably a zeitgeisty piece of pop culture. So, having read it, one of the things that is maybe worth noting about the book is that it's not as scandalous as I had anticipated. The way that I would describe it is the tea is warm, but it's not hot. Okay. All right. It is not scalding? No. No. And overall, it's kind of really sad. Oh, Jesus. Is it about the trauma of mother death? Yes. Wow. It is. Marcella, we have established I only like writing books about the trauma (laughs) of mother death. I don't like reading them. Have no interest Mm -mm. in this. But as much as I think that the trauma of mother death is central to the construction of the memoir, I don't think it is as important to the function and the circulation of the memoir Mm, as a mm -hmm. cultural text. So we actually... It's not what's making it zeitgeisty. Exactly. Exactly. So what is making it zeitgeisty? Why do you think it's like so of the moment? Yeah. So I I have three approximate clusters of moving pieces. That's actually the the brand of health cookie that I had for (laughs) breakfast. They're called approximate clusters. Well, let's start with the first approximate cluster, Mm -hmm. which is the least interesting and probably the most akin to the psyllium seed husk, okay? And that would be Succession. The show? Haven't watched it. Not the show. Although the show, ooh, we'll talk about Succession in another episode maybe someday. Okay, no, I mean the actual, like, monarchical succession because Granny is dead, Long live the king. (laughs) William is the heir. And Harry, as his memoir explains, is the spare. So thing one, queen died, and we all sort of became really aware of the monarchy. Totally. Yeah. 
So the other thing, I think this might be maybe the biggest thing, the biggest moving part, and it's that geriatric millennials like you and like me, we're adults now. We're like literal adults, even if our lives are protracted adolescence into perpetuity. We're adults, and we grew up, our childhoods were shaped by Princess Diana's celebrity. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of us were impacted by her death. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Hannah. I remember literally where I was sitting in the living room when I found out. Yeah. Me too. Viscerally. Yeah. And so the fact that now like prestige drama, like The Crown and movies starring like queer icons like Kristen Stewart are like about Princess Diana, Mm -hmm. the moments, the years and months leading up to her death. Like I think this says a lot about how impactful it was for us as kids. And now that we're grownups, it's like Oh, well, this is part of the defining fabric of the millennial. Yeah, yeah. And she was such a an interesting figure for a sort of moment of shift in celebrity culture mm-hmm. because she was somebody who participated in something much closer to the kind of hashtag relatable mm. celebrity culture that would sort of like grow up and become mm-hmm. more of a norm, right? Mm-hmm. That she was, it was, you know, she was the people's princess. She was not like the rest of the royal family who couldn't be less interested in coming across as human. You know, she had this this interest in being a kind of like relatable human figure. Mm-hmm. And I think she used that relatability in some really interesting political ways, right? Like her activism with people with HIV and AIDS. Like she used her sort of perceived relatability as a way to destigmatize people living with HIV and AIDS. But totally. Yeah. It also means that like her and I think to some extent her kids are like these celebrity figures who we I think, felt like we could relate to in a way that we never did with, like, QE2. Bless her. Not a relatable person. (laughs) No. Possibly her affection for dogs? I was going to (laughs) say! The only relatable thing about her, fondness for corgis. Because who doesn't love a corgi? And so then, add to that the fact that we're basically the same age as William and Harry. William is Mm -hmm. like a teensy bit older than you and me, maybe like by a year. Mm -hmm. And Harry is a teensy bit younger than us by maybe like a year. There are our generational peers. Totally. So when we were going to school, they were going to school. When we were going to university, they were going to university or being bullied out of going to university by their parents because they're not the learning type. This is straight out of the book. I almost did my year abroad at the University of Sterling because that's where William went. You, Hannah, could have been the the next queen. Absolutely not. There's so many things standing (laughs) in the way of that possibility. (laughs) Wow. So, like, I think watching William and Harry grow up and the way that the media represented them to Mm -hmm. us played a big role in the way that we kind of think about them as not really, not even as as peers, but like as like extended family. And I don't know if Americans feel this way, but like that's kind of how I think of them since Canadians are so like weirdly attached to the royal family. I can't wait to hear what Americans think about all of this <laughs> because every time like I get why we're interested yeah. in the royal family, but <laughs> Why do Americans care? Like, you had a whole war to get rid of these fuckers. <laughs> but I do understand why the introduction of Meghan Markle into the royal gossip machine has been so interesting to so many Americans because she is an actor, she is an American, and she is Black. And so it brings a lot of a lot of stuff into the conversation about the royal family that obviously like resonates with American culture. Totally. Yeah. And I, and I think like Harry's marriage, like the announcement of his engagement to Meghan Markle was like a real 
for me at least, it it was a real turning point in how he was figured in mm. the media. I really feel like up until that point, he was always represented as like the precocious little brother, the like the naughty one, the one who's he always the getting spare. in trouble. Because he's the spare. He's like the bad one, you know? William has to be the good, mature, and responsible one. Harry gets to be the little scamp who, like, plays (laughs) pool naked. (laughs) Just a little stinker. (laughs) But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, he is, like, in love with Meghan Markle. Is being in love the opposite of being a little stinker? A hundred percent. Yes. Yes. Okay. For Harry? Totally. Yeah. There's a third cluster, isn't there? There is a third cluster. Yeah. So. Harry's being in love with Megan, like so visibly in love with Megan, is kind of what leads me. <gasps> oh, he's a wife guy. He's not just a wife guy. He's like, he is, he's a man who believes his wife. He like, Ooh. he he loves Megan and he believes Megan. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So this brings me to the third approximate cluster. The Me Too movement. Wah, wah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Hear me out, okay? Okay, so we're we're in a really weird moment because the Me Too movement was like really kind of broiling in like 2018. And then the pandemic happened and shut down the planet. So like, I think we haven't, we didn't really get a chance to see how the the publicness and the commonplaceness of the Me Too movement would have played out if it hadn't been like superseded by an even bigger global crisis, if you will. So here's what's really interesting about that, Hannah, is that I think that the progress that we might have seen, which has been interrupted and shoved to the back burner, I think that part of what has made that invisible is the very noticeable shift in the types of masculinity that we are willing to celebrate or willing Mm. to continue celebrating. Because one of the things about like the Me Too movement focusing on celebrities is that it created this sense that you can't risk adoring men. It's too risky. I know. Oh, say it again for the people (laughs) in the back. The emotional investment in famous men is too risky. Don't do it. And so... They're just going to let you down. They're just going to let you down. And and we saw this with so many, so many types of men. It wasn't just like one type of man turned out to be like chronically abusive. It was that like, you never know. Men who you think are perfectly good turn out to actually be like incredibly hateful perverts or something yeah, like that. Yeah, hateful, hateful perverts. perverts. Not all perverts are hateful. Hashtag. Hashtag not all perverts. So have we stopped loving men? Have we stopped celebrating men? No, of course not. No, both because... We live under patriarchy, patriarchy. But, but also just because they are 50% of the population of, <laughs> yeah. of humans on the planet. So I think I think I'm gonna put aside my my well-documented misandry for a moment mm-hmm. and say that I do think it is a legitimate stance to love some particular <laughs> men. Totally, totally. Don't tell any of the men in my life, they will get big heads about it. Oh, seriously. So I think that if we look at the types of men who we have rallied around in the post-lockdown world, if you will. The types of men who at least I feel comfortable celebrating until they prove me wrong is men who very clearly seem to like women, who seem to respect differences, and who seem comfortable being wrong and being silly and being vulnerable in public. So, you know, we're not ta- we're not here to talk about all of Hollywood's not yet douchebags. We're here to talk specifically about Windsor Castle's not yet douchebag and it's uh and it's Harry. 
And I have to say that like a decade ago, I don't know if I would have believed you if you had told me that I would one day be referring to Prince Harry as being a, a soft boy. But here I am. Yeah. From the moment that Twitter told me there was going to be a black princess, I have been like captivated by how Harry comports himself as Meghan Markle's partner. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Because he is her partner. Oh, yeah. Totally. He like has her back and you can tell that he hashtag believes women mm -hmm. because of the way that he has responded to the horrifying racism that she has experienced at the hands of the royal family and the British tabloid media. Totally. He very clearly has not tried to pretend it's not true. Like, he clearly mm -hmm. believes her and, like, has supported her and taken action to, like, make her life better. Yeah. And so, like, as the, the reader of text that I am, I'm, like, every single thing that they do as a couple, I'm, like, looking at it in this, like, big web of, like, what it means that a prince is making these decisions, right? Mm. And, like, even the fact that they named their children Archie and Lilibet, like, like nothing about this relationship or this couple is, like, preparing for the throne. They mm. are all in on being a family. And, wow, do I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> Marcel, I love to hear about your love. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. I love to hear about things that you love. But I am dead inside and so can only relate to things through a theoretical lens. So mm. could we theorize this instead? Yes, I will do that for you, Hannah. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Hannah, it's not the hero we deserved, but it is the theory we need. <laughs> Speaking of Batman references, Hannah, do you remember when you first started thinking about masculinities as a plural? I do. I was a graduate student dedicated to thinking about feminism. And I remember encountering a conference about, you know, like post colonial masculinities. And just being like, oh, oh, cool. What a fun new way to justify talking about men all the time. Mm. Mm. Like, Same. great. All of these people being like, let's study masculinities. And I'm like, no, thank you. Not interested. <laughs> I will confess I have come around to the study of masculinities. I think particularly around becoming like truly divesting myself of like my second wave feminism and coming to understand gender as a significantly more complex thing than mm -hmm. women and men and understanding how like amongst other things masculinities might be a thing I too can access and participate mm -hmm. in and mm -hmm. take pleasure in rather than only ever understanding it as like the boot on my <laughs> on my neck <laughs> Um, <laughs> on your femme, femme neck. The boot on my femme neck. So yeah, yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've kind of come around to thinking about masculinities. That rings true for me too. I absolutely had that same initial response of like, what do you mean you're turning women's studies into gender studies? Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? But then we listened and learned. And that this is, is the, the, this that's is the, the moral. important thing, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be right in your first instinct. It's okay. Just, uh, just listen. You'd be amazed at how often listening just for a just for a sec, you know. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's us yeah. subtweeting transphobes. So, uh, Marcel, always. are we going to talk about masculinities? Yeah, yeah, we are. We are. I want to start by talking about patriarchy, and here's here's why. I uh, spent a little time reading some of. Bell Hooks's The Will to Change. God, always a good way to spend some time is reading some Bell Hooks. I know, I know. And I have to, I gotta say, like, it's great. She's got nothing but wisdom. But I had a real moment when I was reading her definition of 
patriarchy, which I Mm -hmm. will share with everybody, when I was like, oh, this is definitely from 2004. Okay. Like, the language that she uses is is dated in a way that well you'll you, I'll I'll just I'll just read it okay? okay so bell hooks defines patriarchy in the will to change as and i quote a political social system that insists that males are inherently dominating superior to everything and everyone deemed weak especially females and endowed with the right to dominate and rule over the weak and to maintain that dominance through various forms of psychological terrorism and violence, end quote. Now, Hannah, can you guess? <laughs> can you guess what the language is that gave me discomfort? Yeah, I would say that it's referring to people as males and females. Exactly. Though I will say, in Bell Hook's defense, which she doesn't need because neither of us are attacking her, that sometimes when you are trying to define an oppressive system, you have to you have to be like, this is actually just part of how this oppressive system works. Sure. Is that it believes there are these things called males and these things called females. Totally. Um, and that one of those things gets to run the world and the other one is dominated. So it's always a useful reminder to be like, oh, the whole division of the world into these binary gendered categories is in self a function of the patriarchy. So... I got to confess that like when I was thinking about how to approach the theory for this, uh, for this pilot, I really wasn't sure where to go um, because, you know, I don't know who to trust sometimes. (laughs) And I always trust bell hooks. Good. (laughs) So that's that's why I started with bell hooks. And so while I would never use the term male or female except to discuss auxiliary cables, I do think that the way that she describes the representation of patriarchy is and remains important. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what does she have to say about representations of patriarchy? So with respect to pop culture, she talks about like a a handful of different um, like television shows and movies. Mm -hmm. And the one that has remained the most culturally present is probably Goodwill Hunting. So she talks about Goodwill Hunting? She does. Yeah. Yeah. She talks about Goodwill Hunting. So she says, and I quote, contemporary books and movies offer clear portraits of the evils of patriarchy without offering any direction for change. And until we can create a popular culture that affirms and celebrates masculinity without upholding patriarchy, we will never see a change in the way that masses of males think about the nature of their identity, end quote. Okay, so that's a useful distinction between patriarchy and masculinity, isn't it? Totally, yeah. Like, you can indeed embrace masculinity without subscribing to patriarchy as wow. a system. Shocking. I know I overuse this phrase, but huge of true. <laughs> and I get this, I get this critique as well that's like at the end of Goodwill Hunting, in the very moment where there is a suggestion that he might be ready to like be different, he leaves. Yeah. <laughs> he leaves. Yeah. He leaves. And leaving is the thing that makes him different. But then we don't get to see any of the actual like tricky business of living a life outside of toxic masculinity. So we've got from Bell Hooks a definition of patriarchy. Does she give us a definition of masculinity? Uh, I didn't look for one. Okay. <laughs> I didn't Legit. I went I went elsewhere. I went okay. to I went to the library. I went back to the library. So I actually have a whole bunch of uh snippets of scholars writing about masculinity. So according to Robert Morrell, um, prior to the 1990s, masculinity was largely and widely understood as singular and as separate from gender. So like there were scholars separate from gender because only women have gender. (laughs) Right? In the same way that only people of color have race, right? It was that same thinking. Because it's the because it is the norm from which everything deviates. So while there were some scholars writing in the 80s and these scholars were influenced by feminism and they were theorizing masculinity as a gender, 
as an area, it really doesn't take off as, as an area of study. It doesn't really yeah. take off until the 90s when, you know, feminists like you and me were getting mad about it. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. And we got so mad that they were like, fine, we'll create an entire scholarly field about it. Yeah. So, okay. So now I want to talk about, I want to introduce Chris Haywood and Thomas Johansson, who give us a definition for masculinity. Okay. Singular. Singular. Okay. So they say, and I quote, masculinity is a relational concept often used indiscriminately and applied to males of all ages, assuming the same logic of identity and practices of a three-year-old child with those of a middle-aged man. End quote. So what this means is that the term is not an analytical term. It's a descriptive term, and it describes too many things to be an actual description. Gotcha. And that's why it has to be plural. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Raywin Connell is credited with the intentional use of the plural masculinities, um, specifically to resist an essentializing, like, quote unquote, true masculinity or, or some kind of true masculinity that, quote, proceeds from men's bodies, end quote. Oh, good. So masculinity is not only lets us complicate it, but also lets us like de-essentialize it. Yes. Yes, exactly. Great. Okay. So if we have a whole bunch of different kinds of masculinities, how do we refer to the one that really sucks and seems to make everything else shitty? Well, that... Is it toxic masculinity? You know what? It is, but it's not. Okay. It's... What is it? Hegemonic masculinity. So a hegemon is like the 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 person with the power. Okay. Mm. So hegemonic masculinity is another way of saying like the dominant masculinity, the normative masculinity. Okay. And it probably won't come as a surprise that people who embody that kind of masculinity feel very uncomfortable being called toxic. So <laughs> I think that's why. <laughs> That's why using the term hegemonic masculinity to sort of separate out the toxic behaviors from the behaviors that happen to correspond with power <laughs> is, is useful. They're not gotcha. mutually inclusive, but they're not mutually exclusive either. Yeah, it's a Venn diagram with a significant amount of overlap. Okay, so I'm going to give you Cliff Cheng's definition of hegemonic masculinity. Okay, it goes like this, and I quote, the hegemonic definition of manhood, and this is really going to blow your mind, Hannah, is a man in power, a man with power, and a man of power. <laughs> There's more. We equate manhood with being successful, capable, reliable, in control. The very definitions of manhood we have developed in our culture maintain the power that some men have over other men and that men have over women. End quote. All right. So if we have a general, if vague, sense of what hegemonic masculinity is, then how are we going to define all of the non-hegemonic masculinities? Burr, I don't know. Oh, it sounds like we need another term. No, okay. <laughs> We're going to go back to Haywood and Johansson, okay? Uh -huh. So their interest is marginalized masculinities, okay? And what counts as marginalized masculinity is, quote, located and defined in relation to men that hold cultural privilege. From this perspective, masculinity becomes the resource through which marginalization takes place, end quote. Okay, we've got, uh, you know, I love the word Ouroboros, so I'm going to say an Ooh. Ouroboros here, a theoretical Ouroboros. That's a snake that's eating its own tail, where it's like, okay, so masculinity, hegemonic masculinity is the masculinity in power, and marginalized masculinities are the masculinities that are excluded or othered by hegemonic masculinity. So that means masculinities that are defined by not being in power. But how do we define them if the way that we define masculinity is through its proximity to power? Like, and this is why, this is why it's so slippy, right? Mm. Slippy sloppy. This is why it's so slippery. No, nope, slippy, slippy sloppy. 
this is why it's so slippy sloppy is because you can't you can't define hegemonic masculinity as one single thing when you don't know when that one thing does not remain the one thing that is powerful over history because what we as a society and as a culture value will change it might be that one day tenderness is the hegemonic masculinity i mean that's the thing about hegemony is that it is actually not a value judgment it's just about what the is the norm it's descriptive but that hegemony has a tendency to attract power to it right mm-hmm. what is dominant is often what is powerful and by attract mm-hmm. power i mean attract political power attract economic power and so as we watch our definition of hegemonic masculinity begin to shift we watch the kind of masculinity that makes money start to shift we watch the kind of masculinity because capitalism baby so like there is this this way that is worth attending to as we think about marginalized masculinities of being like at what point do some of those marginalized masculinities become the new hegemonic masculinity and how might they start to accrue their own power and their own Mm -hmm. capital and their own, you know, complicity in the upholding of the patriarchy, I guess. Yeah, and... We also, like, we've got to keep in mind, like, which kinds of men have access to those forms of power mm. and and which ones don't, right? Because we often tend to see certain types of masculinity being described as progressive, but those tend to align or be demonstrated or embodied by wealthy, white, educated cis heterosexual men, right? So like a Prince Harry, if you will. A Prince Harry, if you will. Okay. One other thing. Okay. Just one. And then we're done. And then we're done. So I don't know if you know this, Hannah, but uh, I take research very seriously. Yeah, I do know this about you. And so in preparing for this episode... I listened to Secret Feminist Agenda episode 2.25, Soft Boys, a.k.a. Tender Masculinity. And I want to talk about so many things. This is, sorry, for people, for listeners who don't know, that's my podcast (laughs) that I made. (laughs) Without me. Without Marcel, because she was busy. So here's why I feel very excited about all of these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The hashtag Me Too, which was started in... 2006 by Tarana Burke as a movement to address sexual violence by 2018 was everywhere. It was like a household name. People were writing about it in the Atlantic. It was all over mainstream and social media, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. 2018. Also, when you were talking about Soft boys and tender masculinity. Uh These two things overlap, which I think is really cool. And the things that you were identifying as being representations of soft and tender masculinities are also things that other people were identifying as soft and tender masculinities. Indeed, they were things that I was thinking back to when I was like, what were the soft and tender masculinities that I first remember thinking about? I want to quote what you say about John Hodgman of the Maximum Fun Podcast Network and host of the Judge John Hodgman podcast, okay? Mm -hmm. So you say, To be a public figure with a significant following and to be a public figure who has literally every form of privilege attached to you and to use that platform to model what it looks like to just constantly be learning and constantly be opening yourself up in very, very gentle and careful ways. It was so touching to me in that moment in the midst of ongoing and horrific news about male violence, ellipsis, 
In a world where it feels sort of natural to be a little afraid of men or a lot afraid of men, it is comforting and heartening to have in popular culture these images of other possibilities, of other ways that masculinity might look, of other things that masculinity might be. End quote. Ooh, such a smart lady. Beautifully said, Hannah. And also, if this is true about a man who we don't see because he does a podcast, it is, I think, also worth thinking about when we're talking about a fucking prince. Yes, yes. A hundred, <laughs> the prince of England. A hundred percent. Oh, my God. Okay. All right, Marcel. I feel ready to, like put all this into conversation and just construct ourselves some some informed hot takes. Awesome. Let's talk about Prince Harry. That scamp. Okay, Marcel, please make an internet joke come to life and tell me your thesis. Marginalized masculinities aren't new, but in 2018, we saw a surge of tender and soft expressions of masculinity in mainstream media at the same time the hashtag MeToo movement had reached its boiling point. 2018 is also the year that Prince Harry married Meghan Markle. In this essay, I will argue that the widespread desire and acceptance for tender, dare I say humble, masculinities finally created a media landscape interested in seeing Prince Harry as a person. In a shocking revelation of facts, the Commonwealth's precocious younger brother, Prince Harry, turns out to be a great role model for cishet white boys everywhere. I am convinced by, because you know, this is material girls and you know, I'm always convinced by material arguments. (laughs) I am convinced by your argument about the alignment of his uh, marriage and the way that it has played out in the media Mm -hmm. with the Me Too movement and with this phase in the Me Too movement that was really interested in sort of recuperating tender masculinities. Listen, this is what I tell my students, okay? A thesis has to be arguable. So if it's a thesis, somebody needs to be able to say, I disagree, and here's why. Otherwise, it's just a statement of fact. <laughs> well, I think I think the thing that I want us to like keep complicating this thesis with is mm-hmm. the celebrity culture of it all. You know, I can't help thinking about, like, the rise of the wife guy as a type. Tell me about this, because I've never heard this term before. So wife guys are men who build their personalities and their public personas around how much they love their wives. Oh, okay. Do you remember when that guy went viral for writing an essay about how he loves his curvy wife? No. Oh, my God. This guy wrote an essay about how, like, his wife is a size eight, but he still loves her. I'm sorry. (laughs) Size eight. Truly, like, included photographs, (laughs) and she is just, like, a, like, not even remotely fat person. The point being that it was a man being like, everybody, please clap. I love my curvy wife. And there is this dark side to the wife guy. I mean, both that it's, like men continuing to occupy a lot of public space to garner a lot of attention, but also the wealth and power that comes Mm -hmm. with that attention by using Mm -hmm. their wives in particular rhetorical ways. Yeah, I think that if nothing else, what Prince Harry's book is doing is attempting to reclaim his public image. Mm. I wouldn't describe the book as being about their marriage okay because it's that's a a pretty it's a small part of it like one of the reasons why I say that the tea is warm and not hot is because he acknowledges a lot of the rumors about his life about his like choices and behaviors and stuff the only one I remember well is that he dressed up as a Nazi for a party once yes okay so this is like the closest we got to some hot tea okay is him telling this story and how he was in conversation with Kate and William 
at the store and was like, they've got this outfit and they've got this outfit. I don't know which one to go with. And they were like, go with the Nazi uniform. That's hilarious. Because the what theme store? was... The the it, it's England. I don't know. And a place in England where princes shop. They must have everything. You know what? Fair. They don't let me in those stores. So the theme of the party was colonials and natives. Oh, fuck. Okay. So there's no good costume at that party. No, no, there was okay. no good costume. So like the the details are very much like, okay. Well, William and Kate were aware of this and they were part of the decision making process. But because of the way the media figures Harry, it's like, oh, that scoundrel did another naughty thing when it's part of a bigger culture, like his choices. So he's, so what I would say is like, Harry doesn't (laughs) come across as defending himself to, like, I didn't read it as him being defensive. It was more like, These people accused me of doing cocaine. I was doing cocaine. I never did cocaine at these places. And the people who said that I was doing cocaine were lying. But I couldn't do a drug test. I couldn't do a drug test to prove that I wasn't doing it because I was doing it. It's just that I was doing it with these Mm -hmm. other people Mm -hmm. and not with the people who... So this is why I say it's like very much about reclaiming his public image. It's like he... The impression I get is he's never been allowed to tell his own story. Because people have always been telling it for him. And so now he's telling all the stories. Some of them are very boring. So to continue to, you know, just fucking work to dismantle your thesis, like the terrible little thesis gremlin that I am. (laughs) But it's especially funny because the premise is, having not read the book, I want to dismantle your thesis, which is a hilarious premise. No, it's just more questions. I just have more questions. One of the forms of public speech that have characterized the Me Too movement and what has followed is the male apology, Mm, mm -hmm. which is often sort of characterized by a lot of work of contextualizing and by a commitment to changed behavior moving forward. Mm -hmm. And frequently those apologies ring profoundly empty and are transparently part of a project of reputation recovery that is ultimately, like so many things, about making money. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I will often get like a gut feeling. And I I would have to think more about how it is I decide for myself what apologies I believe and which ones I don't. But with the example that you quoted back to me of things that I said about John Hodgman, for example, like, you know, when he when he makes a mistake and apologizes and moves forward, it feels real to me because it's an ongoing and iterative practice of learning in public, which is a thing that I am into is the idea that we can make mistakes in public and continue to learn and that we just keep practicing learning out loud versus apologies that feel rote, like they were written by a PR person, like they are just part of this, this, you know, reputation cleaning process. So if this book is participating, if Spare is participating to some degree in the genre of reclaiming one's reputation in the wake of Me Too, not in an obvious, like, he's not repairing his reputation from accusations of sexual violence, but... Right. Not, like, causal, but, like... Yeah, there's a correlation to that genre, certainly. And that's the sort of context in which... Part of the context in which this memoir has emerged... Mm -hmm. What, if anything, about it makes it feel convincing to you? Because, you know, when we're talking about a work like Spare, really, at the end of the day, we're not talking about Harry as a person. We're talking about the way Harry as a public figure circulates through popular culture, the way that his memoir is itself a piece of popular culture. And it clearly has been received as one that 
enshrines Harry as this kind of, of you know, <laughs> soft boy figure. So, mm-hmm. so you know, from, from your perspective as a reader of it and as a, a critic of things like celebrity and rape culture and masculinities, mm-hmm. what makes it an effective pop culture moment rather than one that just reads as as like shallow or empty or rote? Yeah, that is such a good question. There are two things that come to mind. Prince Harry reads the book. Mm. Like he reads his audiobook. And this only makes sense. It's a memoir. It would be weird if somebody else read it. Yeah. But I feel this way whenever an author reads their own book, particularly when it's a memoir. I feel like I'm in an intimate mm. conversation with them. I think that's the point, right? That's why that's why they do it. So that's both not surprising, but also very powerful and effective. And like, he's not like a, he's not a performer. And so the way that he, one of the reasons I think why the book is a bit boring at times is because it's a little bit monotonous. Like the tone in which he's telling all of these vignettes about his life is pretty constant. And It can be like, okay, well, now we're back in Afghanistan and I can't remember why you left, but now we're back and here's what's going on and okay and okay and then that happened to you. Like there's there's like a lot of just documentation, but it feels personal because he's reading it in a way that like if I were if I were reading the the paper book, if I couldn't do dishes while he was telling me about his like disgusting trench foot. Like, oh, no. I, I know. I would probably just skip the whole chapter. Like, fuck the British colonial invasion of Afghanistan. Like, I don't want to read about this. Okay, yes. I'm totally convinced by this that, like, the audiobook in particular really, like, participates in a media mode that feels really parasocial, really intimate. Very much so. Very much so. The one that I don't really have the word for is the the degree of vulnerability in terms of some of the things that he confesses. And I'm so I'm not talking about like talking about his frostbitten penis. The thing that really got me was when he talked about how this is me summarizing. This isn't how he frames it. But like he's never been able to like learn a skill. So he has been raised to be a prince. He was discouraged from going to university. So he has his high school education and he was in the military and became like a military, like a helicopter pilot. But he can't get like a job because he he functionally has... He doesn't know how to do anything. Yeah. And not only does he not know how to do anything, but he's like lived a particular lifestyle where he doesn't know how to do the kinds of like basic stuff that I think those of us who grew up like working in middle class just like had to figure out how to do, you know, because he never had to. And so on the one hand, it's like, oh yeah, poor Harry. And that's not what I'm trying to suggest. (laughs) Like, oh, the poor prince. It doesn't come across that way. Like the way that he sort of reveals this kind of really embarrassing fact about himself is like essentially saying like, yeah, I would love to not be a sponge on the taxpayers, but my family didn't let me go to school. So like, I didn't get to learn how to like do things. I don't know how to program a computer. I don't know how to like, I don't know how to wash windows. Like he doesn't have certain skills. And that's Mm. really sad. That's vulnerable. And also an interesting, like embedded critique of the sort of strategic uselessness of the monarchy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He talks a lot in the book about how how much he loves his family. And he talks a lot about how, like, he is part of the monarchy and he does believe in the monarchy. But at the same time, it's also kind of like, but but why, though? Like, he's not convincing me (laughs) that the monarchy is valuable. And I would be surprised if he convinced himself (laughs) by the end of the book. 
I mean, it's one of the reasons why I have found him interesting as a figure is that I think by virtue of who his mother was and who his wife is, that he is really well positioned to be somebody who like knows the degree to which the monarchy is fake and whether or not he is willing to actually get up on a podium and say the monarchy is fake. Well, his actions speak pretty loudly, don't they? They do. He and his family left England. They left a very cushy lifestyle because it ultimately sucked. Yeah. And now they... I don't know, probably live in a mansion in (laughs) California? I don't know. They live in a mansion in California. Like the true, humble, (laughs) everyman he is. Yeah, we should we should talk about the prince and princess of capitalism, right? Like we should <laughs> we should acknowledge the fact that their their celebrity, this couple's celebrity, Harry's celebrity status improvement via his memoir, via his like public stance supporting Megan in relation to the horrific way that she's been treated by his family, by the British press. It's still, oh, what is it exactly that I'm trying to say, Hannah? This is, it's the, it's the stickiness of what, for example, Bell Hooks was articulating about the need for cultural models of tender masculinity is that we need pop culture We use pop culture. It matters in really profound ways for how we see the world and the models that we have of how to move through the world. And also the pop in pop culture is popular and popularity in late capitalism is also the accrual of wealth. And so we must always be looking at pop culture from these sort of two sides of being like, all right, you know, what really interesting possibilities is this modeling for us? And also who's getting rich? It's not me. (laughs) It's not me. Not yet. (laughs) Just wait till my memoir comes out. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us for this pilot episode of Material Girls. We are so excited to be launching this new show that's not about Harry Potter, but is in the spirit of our original series, Witch Please. That's why we talked about a Harry. That's why we had to talk about a Harry. If you're here because you enjoyed that show, we want to say thank you for your support and for giving us the financial footing to create this new show. We're still everywhere you know how to find us on Instagram and Twitter at Oh Witch Please. If you'd like to support us in this new endeavor, please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ohwitchplease and find a tier that works for your budget. We are entirely listener funded, so your support goes directly to paying our incredible team. If becoming a Patreon supporter isn't in the cards right now, that is okay. We love when you share the show, particularly as we build up an audience for Material Girls. Please post about us on social, text your friends and family about episodes they might find interesting, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Material Girls is a Witch Please production and is distributed by Acast. You can listen to all of the Witch Please projects on Acast or at ohwitchplease.ca. Our website is expanding every day thanks to our digital projects coordinator, Gabby. You can also find transcripts, merch, sign up for our newsletter. Oh, heck, just go check it out. Special thanks, as always, to our executive producer, Hannah Rehack, a.k.a. Coach. To our social media manager and marketing designer, Zoe Mix. And to our sound engineer, Eric Magnus. Our Patreon is the heart and soul of this podcast because it lets us do really amazing things like pay all those sexy people we just mentioned (laughs) so that they can live and pay their rent and eat food. So at the end of every episode, we will thank everyone who has joined our Patreon or boosted their tier, which does mean that members of our faculty club will only get directly thanked if they boost to the Ministers of Magic tier, which is, you know, frankly, a slightly unhinged tier. But listen, 
If you are feeling the need for some personal thanks, just ask for it on your exclusive Slack channel because we obviously love you and are incredibly grateful for you. We'll tell you. We'll tell you anytime you want to hear it. We'll tell you anytime you want to hear it. We'll be back next episode to tackle another piece of pop culture through a whole new theoretical lens. But until then, later, Gators. (laughs) 